In the third episode of Creative Smoothie, Max Acevedo, or Maximiliano for those who don't know him, joins me on a conversation about design, research, and user experience. He's currently a senior product designer at DevBridge, and he has worked for companies like GE Transportation and HP. He has a degree in industrial design and a master's in design management. He helps research and develop complex design systems that resolve various urban, digital, and physical problems, amongst others. Honestly, he knows so much about this, and that's why I'm excited to have him here today. He's also the co-founder of Two Under, a golf clothing company that sponsors young ambassadors of the sports. It's not surprising, taking into account his professional golfing experience. In this episode, Max goes deep into what good design really is, he explains how to conduct research that matters, and even walks us through his creative process. He's an open book of information, and after my talk with him, I learned that I'm probably not doing as much as I should with my research. Tune in and find out more about successful services and why products that seem good at first fail on the market later. Oh, and by the way, before the episode and before I forget, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the podcast. If you're enjoying the latest content, I want to get the free knowledge out into the world to as many people as possible. So thank you for helping me out and enjoy this episode. Hello, Max. Thank you for being here today. All right. Thanks, uh, Vlad, for inviting me. This is pretty cool. Of course. Uh, so the audience already kind of knows a bit about you and the kind of stuff that you worked on before. But for those who've never heard about it before, um, what did you used to do as a user experience design researcher? And what are you currently doing as a senior product designer? Uh, for the yeah. people that are not familiar with these long uh, job names that you get. No, for sure. I think it's a, it's a good topic to talk because uh, in the industry, it's a little bit uh, confusing. Uh, so it's it's nice to say hello to everyone that is listening to um, and kind of explain that in when you're designing digital applications, um, there is a process, right? And we, we're trying to follow the process of uh, design thinking and going from discovery effort to ideation. And then this ideation goes back to research and then you go on delivery and then you talk to and work with um, engineers, whatever. So, so yeah, most of the jobs and, and roles are going to be doing the same thing, but I think the naming is very biased on who's performing it. So I can tell you a little bit about when I was at GE transportation as a senior UX design researcher, I was doing just the research part of the, of the process. So mostly the discovery efforts, um, what did that mean? I mean, we will work, I was working from the strategy part, working with a product manager to define what are the needs of that product? What are the user needs? How can we talk to them? Um, craft interviews, craft some surveys, and then gather that information. And I had a counterpart, what, which was a interaction designer, which was my partner. And then together we will co-create an application and then he will take the learnings that I did in the discovery effort and create the assets, like the visual designs of the, interact the interaction of the software. The way that I see it today is that the product designer, it does the whole thing. So we do, I do, currently I'm doing from discovery effort, from ideation, I do the software, I design it, I craft it, do prototypes and deliver it and send it to developers. So I will say that that's the difference. I can see it like three pieces, which is like the UX researcher, the interaction designer, and then you can work together and do like that specific skill. But as a product designer, you do the whole thing as a whole. That's that's actually very interesting. And um, I think you can get a chance to explain a bit better if you like were to tell me something that you did. I remember you worked on uh, cool design systems for GE and you told me that you're doing something similar now at DevBridge. Uh, could you talk a bit about that? Yeah, I think it's, it's pretty relevant and I'm an advocate of design systems for for the listeners that are that don't know what a design system is, perhaps I can explain a little bit about yeah. what it is so you learn more. Um, so in order to build a piece of software, uh, you need components or assets. So you need buttons, text fields, you need a color scheme, you need a typography, you need code to build dead in the in behind the curtains, right? And a long time ago, they will build just um, a text field for that specific application. So 
what a design system is, it's a set of pieces like a puzzle where you can build your application and then you can create it. From the design perspective, I can talk to you a little bit more about that than the, than the developer perspective, of course. So as a designer, the way that a design system helps you is I already have templates. I know the color schemes of the software. I know what do buttons do, how do drop downs react, how do a search field is going to show a, I don't know, certain information because somebody already designed that component and now I'm just using it to create a product. So um, something that I've learned in the past is that we need to start calling design systems a product because it's a product that enables designers and developers to create a product, which it's a little bit like inception, you know, like, hey, I'm using a product to create another product. But yeah. um, I find it fascinating. Um, uh, when I was at GE Transportation, there was a old third design system in place, but it was used by the whole organization of General Electric, and it wasn't built specifically for the transfer, for transportation industry, which that's happening in a lot of businesses. You are not going to design uh, Uber with the design system of Spotify, because right. it doesn't make sense. Then the, the user needs for Spotify, I, it's a music language and it has its own um, visual language. So that's why you need to have a specific design system for your user needs. Um, so like I said, in, back in GE Transportation, um, it was really cool because I worked with a really fascinating team of uh, several designers were around me. Uh, um, my former boss is the one that started the idea and that was really, really cool. Uh, I learned a lot. I think we, all of us that were on that process, we didn't know a lot about design systems. So we, we kind of learned a lot through the process. We went to a few conferences and, and we really got into what it was and how can we build a design system. So that was really cool. Um, and now in Debridge, which is a consultancy agency, we are currently with one of my clients, we're creating a design system for them. Um, so I think it's it's interesting too that I did it in house at GE, and now I'm helping another company to do the same thing, which it's kind of solving similar issues. So there's definitely like a lot to to it and a lot to unpack. And when somebody thinks product design, they're thinking, oh, they're basically need to come up with like like when you hear product design, you're like somebody it gets paid to think of ideas and create a product, draw it, and it's not definitely not that. Um, do you think that taking all of this into account that nowadays a product success is based only on the product alone? Can a product alone sell itself or do you need the research behind it? Do you need the design systems behind it to make sure that it's going to have an increased lifespan on the market? Or what other components make up uh, product success on the market or failure on the market? That's a good question. I think it's a good discussion to have because I, I feel that we can talk about different products, right? Like right. Um, most most of the products that I've worked with or that I have designed, they've been enterprise products. So it's like products that are using companies indoors or they're using it for their customers, but they're, they're enterprise heavy, heavy products. Uh, I haven't worked in customer facing products like um, as, as it is. So I think there is a difference in between that um how can i say like the success rate of how can you define a success yeah. for certain products i will say that sometimes you notice that in the enterprise world some of these products they are built because they think that they need it without actually needing it so if they even it sounds weird but sometimes you design something that as a researcher you might know oh that's not solving the problem but the client wants that product, so you have to do it, right? Yeah. And it's it's a little tricky because That's how do crazy. you... That's crazy. Yeah, how do you know that, oh, yeah, they need that, but they're asking me to do that. So, yeah, at some point, you are trying to make a happy middle and then right. try to, to solve this, the, the problem, but it's really interesting. Um, but as a, as a general answer, I will say that I think you need to have a problem and then... You, the success of your product is going to be if you are answering that problem, if you are solving that problem, right? So yeah. it's not just like, I have a great idea. How about if we do an app that uh, tells you what to do because you felt sick? 
dude, but is there a problem? Like, what is the problem? How am I solving it? And that's why research is important. Yeah. Because you need to go and ask yourself, why is this problem important? Let's document what's happening. How does users might need it? Let's serve it. Let's find if people actually is going to use it. Uh, and then once you find the problem, now let's solve it. Okay, the problem is validated, but now how do we solve it? That's when ideation comes in. You make different ideas. And um, and I think that's that's something that happens a lot in the entrepreneur world where you find, oh, I have this great idea to create an app that does that. But cool, okay, let's go in that line, but also let's try to go back a little bit. Let's do a proper research and find what is the proper solution. Yeah, and I think that with a lot of that, businesses base their products, like you said, sometimes on no problem or come up with a project that think that solves the problem and it doesn't. Were you ever faced with a situation where you really, like you, like you said, you realized that, hey, this was not going the right way. Either the solution that they were asking for was not correct or the problem in itself to start off with was incorrect. The question that they were asking was incorrect. And if you were faced with something like that, what, how, how do you approach that? How do you tell a multinational company, hey, you're not approaching in the correct way? In a way, it's your job, but how do you do that? Well, there are a couple of situations and I think it's hard to pinpoint one exactly, but it happens all the time. Yeah. So you can be working on a product and then you, you are facing that the, the client is asking you for certain things. You do your research and you find out that that's not the proper way to solve it. So you prove it and you validate it and you're like, hey, I know what you're asking me, but I have this idea. How about if we go through it? You show it the idea and more likely they're going to accept it because they're gonna, that, that's why they're paying you, right? Like they're right. hiring you because you know what you're doing. But if there is a case that, the user tells the, the client tells you, yeah, but I want that because I think that that is the answer. I think it will be a little bit not nice to work with someone like that because you're like, I'm telling you that, that validation with research, like we did it together. And I think that's what I just said is the most important part. Working with the client, you need to co-create. So that co-creation part is really important in consulting because you want to co-create the products with them. It's not just hey, tell me what to do. I'll go back to my office. I'll craft something and then I'll send it back to you. No, it's like, hey, you come here. Let's get together in a workshop. Let's co-create this product of yours. Okay, we have an idea. Now let's bring users and co-create with the users a product. And I think that's when you get a lot of success uh, rate, ratio for finding the proper solution. And in finding the proper solution, like you mentioned, there's a lot of research that has to go on. And when people think research, they think, yeah, you go open up Google and <laughs> type in the question. Yeah. You know that there's so many different types of research. What what are the most prevailing types of research that you use in, in your job? And what are the different kinds like market research, human centered research and so forth? I think it's going to depend on the problem that you are looking for. But um, most companies and most uh, processes are already established. And each company is going to have their, its own processes that you go through research, right? So through the discovery phase, you already have kind of like a book or a template of, I'm going to do this step through this step. Um, of course, you can alter it, the methodologies, depending on the specific needs that you might have. In my opinion, something that it's very worth, and I've seen a pattern doing it in the different jobs that I've had or different teams that I've worked with, it's very similar, where first, your approach with a problem or with a need. So what do I do now with this information? What I like to do is either start with user interviews to start learning a little bit about them. So either I interview the client, which might not be the user, but the client is the person that is paying for it, right? First, I learn from them a little bit. What do you want? How do you want it? When do you need it? That kind of question, that's research. Right. Um, learning how many types of users do you have? How do I get access to them? Where do they work? Are they in the US? Are they in Spain? Are they in Croatia? Where are they allocated, et cetera, right? So, so you gather all of these data and then you can prepare the next steps. What are the next steps? I think something that I find really valuable and I've seen it a pattern that most uh, research pieces are done is a workshop. So we can call it a, I think, let me think about names that they might call it. Is, um, I don't know, like finding, I don't know, like epic workshops or they, they call it a different way, but the, the purpose of the workshop is to put together all of the stakeholders right. of the product or the project, and then try to gather the information that you need in order to keep going. So 
inside of the workshop, we do different methodologies. And that's where you have a book of research methodologies and then you're like, oh, I pick this one, this one, and this one because it fits with the problem that they told me. I think the basics will be, let's set a vision statement, let's create a stakeholder map, let's create users. So like, okay, how many users do we have? We have three different users for this application. All right, who's a user? Let's learn about what they do, what are the tasks, what are the feelings? You can do empathy maps to learn and have empathy with the user. And then you start learning either if you are creating a new, completely new product or you are rebuilding a product. Now, let's go through an user flow. What does users do to complete their task? What are the tasks? Okay, so the goal is to go from point A to point B. What happens there? So we create a journey map, which later on it can be developed into a service blueprint, depending on what you need, right? And then in that workshop, it's really nice to have it with the developers where we're going to be asking about the technical feasibility of that product. What is your environment? What kind of uh, code can we use in your environment? What kind of cloud system? How are we going to build it? What type of uh, developers do you have in your site that are going to be supporting this, this product, et cetera? So I think the workshop is the, the most important piece because that's when you get all of this information. Later on after the workshop, you grab the information and then based on the user map, the user journey map, you can create a service blueprint, which now you're gonna learn more things. And then you might find yourself with, oh, I need to do a study on this specific stage of the journey. Let's go back and now I can interview specific users and then do some ideation. And then you go back and then you put together users and then you co-create it. So I think there is like a book of these methodologies that you can select by the need that you have, I will say. It sounds like there's a, a whole process of information acquirement and constant change as you find out more information, you have to adapt to it. There's obviously a whole team that is needed for a, a, a process that involves research so specific, like what kind of colors are the bonds going to be in order to communicate the emotion that we want to communicate, like patients of a certain disease that are going to use a, an app to keep in touch with their family because they cannot see them because of COVID. What kind of color of the bond would it be and so forth? But what about companies and startups who do not have access to a team that have all that? How can um, somebody that wants to start a, 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 an app or somebody that wants to just start a product, how can they do their due diligence as far as research goes? What would you recommend to somebody who has to do their research themselves or has maybe just another person who can help them research and doesn't have access to, you know, doesn't have the skills to interview, doesn't have the necessary skills to do what you do? I think, I mean, honestly, I think you can learn about it. And I, I know I will encourage people to just go and learn how do you do human center design research? How, how do you, how do I go and do that, that research? Right. And like I said, I just dropped some methodologies, but you can learn right, from different right, books right, right. And, and then learn those methodologies. And I, I will encourage people to don't be scared to do it because it's basically just you're facilitating. Yeah, of course, I went to school to do that. Right. And I took classes. I mean, I took a class that was facilitating creative thinking where you learn how to talk to users. How do you facilitate that? creativity in a room of people. So you learn those things. Of course, you need to go through the process to learn it, but I will encourage people to don't be scared of doing surveys, uh, of, send, of sending your users, you, you have a target. Let's say you are designing something for Formula One fans. Do it, so call your Formula One fan, fans friends and then call them and set interviews with them, make a, a questionnaire that is gonna answer your questions to help you develop the product and then you talk to them, but also you need to talk to outliers. What about those people that they don't like Formula One? What do they op make their opinion of that? So don't be scared of doing those interviews. Once you, are, you have some ideas, let's bring some of those users on, on a workshop. And how about if you start co-creating? Hey guys, I have this idea. Uh, let's co-create. You bring post-its, you bring paper, and then you start drawing shit. COVID situation is happening. Right. I think most people is using that's I think that's a I don't know if you were going well there. the online blackboard, you know, it's okay. Like there's there's similar things that they can do, you know, yeah. with certain limitations. I mean, I, but I've uh, I've been using Miro. I don't know if you know Miro. Yes, the tool. That's I what I was using tool. too. And yeah. playing off of this, I actually gotta ask you because you touched on something interesting. You take a whole class that taught you how to speak and enable creativity in a room. Mm -hmm. But what about now? What about now where human relationships are a bit harder to foster over, you know, virtual calls? It is a bit harder. It's not as easy as being 
going out with somebody mm -hmm. to have a beer and asking them the questions that you know they're more relaxed to answer rather than doing it through a Zoom call, you know? How do you adapt yeah, no. to, to that kind of thinking? I think, dude, you, you just said a really interesting thing. Um, I think in the consultancy world, you're going to hear it over and over that people's like, yeah, what is consultancy? Consultancy is you go and you get embedded into the team and then you learn about them. You need to go to their offices, learn what is their culture, what do they eat, how do they eat it, and then try to solve and help them yep. be better. Now you're not getting that. I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be positive me and trying to look for the best. And uh, I think, I mean, it, it has brought a lot of good things doing things online, honestly. Right. Uh, I mean, I want to think that we are saving money by not traveling that much. Um, you can schedule things faster. You don't need to, oh, book a five hour workshop because we need to do intros. Hi, how are you? Let's eat some snacks. And then you book yeah. a one hour lunch to mitigate and have fun. Yeah, that's important to customer relationships for sure. Because in, if you're talking to your clients, it's important to have that. But when you are talking about the actual work, I think it goes a little faster and it can be more efficient if you do it right. Yeah, the human interactions changes when you do things like I said in Miro because that tool is it's different. But I found myself that some people are shy to do certain things. So like I've experienced people doing a workshop in person, of course, pre-COVID, yeah. um, where you will ask them like, hey, can you sketch something or not even a sketch? Like let's do a, a sample, a crazy eight sample where you, you make a, a page with eight different uh, squares. And then in that page, you, you draw like eight really quick ideas for solving the problem, right? And this person, I, I remember perfectly this human, he didn't pick up his pen. Like he didn't do anything. Yeah. And I'm like, it's so hard when you try to push people to do something that they don't want to do. And of course, like you said, you learn in a class, how do you push people to feel uncomfortable and try to do certain things? So like, yeah, you can tell them like, hey, don't worry if you don't know how to draw, you can use words or you can help them to be creative in that moment. But there's people that they don't do it. I feel that when they are in a computer, in their home or whatever, doing this kind of ideation through a platform, it can get them more comfortable. Yeah, because there's a screen in front of them kind of like protecting them yeah. from the responsibility, not responsibility, but like facing the critique more or less or facing yeah. the opinions of others. I, I don't know what it is. I mean, we can talk all day about it, but it's yeah. really interesting. And I, I think it has brought a lot of good things. Definitely, we are missing the human interaction, the client engagement, but to learn about tools, to learn about processes, I think it's really good. Also, your span of attention is more there. It's happened a lot. And I mean, I've been in workshops and probably you've been in a long meeting when you are in person. And man, it's, it's tough to, to, to yeah. pay attention to that thing for five hours. Yeah. When you're in a computer, you, you can't be in your phone in a computer. I mean, you can, but it, it, you, you, people see you. Right. And I think it makes you be more engaged than if you are in a room. I think so. I think I've experienced that me personally, but also I've seen people more engaged in, in a workshop during, uh, during a Zoom call. So you're also in the front lines of developing basically the new design systems for the world that's coming. There's, it's definitely a, a change that's going to happen from now on. Do you see all those things like, hey, we're not like services are not going to be able to necessarily have people to people interaction and all that do you see that when you think of these new design systems do you how are you applying that like how are you, how has it changed how has the thinking changed around the products that you design which you know they vary from you know industry yeah. to industry but how has this changed your outlook in uh, your research i think you you said a couple interesting things the first thing you said is that it's a new thing i don't think it's a new thing i think we've had design systems all around but we tend to ignore it so I don't remember, where did I hear this? I mean, I, I know where I was, I was at a conference, but I don't remember who said it. So I'm, I'm gonna repeat what that person said, which it was really interesting. Look at the design system that exists in the world. One of the examples was, look at the music uh, boards that yeah. they use in the studios. They have certain patterns that are repeated so you understand it and how did they build the aux uh, input, input yeah. cable, right? Whatever. And then how did like, you see it and you recognize it? So they could have built it differently. And now like today they can do different technology to do it different. But no, that there's a pattern or a design system that you learn over time. And now 
it's so easy to grab and go. So basically a design system, the way that I see it, and a lot of people um, describes it, it's like a box of Legos where each of the chips is like, you are plugging and playing a, 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 an application. It's not just from a design perspective, but from a development perspective, it helps them a lot because if right now you're a developer and I tell you, hey, let's do this feature and it includes a calendar, you're not gonna go and create the code for a calendar. You're gonna look at library and grab a calendar, right? So that's been going on for a long, long time. I think new companies, they have design systems by default because they need to do a new application. I think where it's very disruptive, the design systems is in legacy companies, in multinational legacy companies that they haven't been updated their software for like over 15 years. So I think that's where this is a beautiful thing. And it's really cool because both of the design systems that I've created, the applications that are going to be updated with that design system, dude, they were created in 2005. That's so like, crazy. And they still use it. So how like, do you transfer from one to, how do you transfer from, that's I, just this idea just came into my head. How do you take that system, build a new one? Okay, that's already hard. How do you get the whole entire company and its employees, right? to switch to a whole entire new design? Is it gradual? Is it like a cut? How is it? I think it, now that you just touched a very important part. A design system is not just, hey, I have the product here, leave it, take it, bye. No, right. no, no. There are two things that are very important in a design system, an adoption model and a contribution model. So the adoption model is like what you just said. Okay, who is gonna start using it? And why? So that's when you go into executive levels or into a business plan, and then you're like, hey, this product is more feasible to be sold if we update it and it's gonna be easier and faster or it's gonna be uh, more challenging. So let's start with this one. So I think it is a business plan. What did they decide to do? I've seen in some other places that they, they do this adoption um, model through a reward system. So like you as a product owner inside of the company, hey, we are going to reward you with this thing if you adopt the design system. Okay. I think it does get pricey if an application is too old. Now, I've seen the cases that the application is so old and outdated that they don't, re they don't remake, they remake the whole application. They don't just update it. They're like, you know what? We're going to throw away this application and redo it because if we remake it, it's going to be so expensive. You need to change the complete framework of development of code because it's so old that you cannot update every single line. So it's easier to rethink and rebuild the application. Another problem that we face is that, yeah, now you have this beautiful UI kit with new code that you're gonna build. But the question is, is the 15 year old application doing and solving a problem? That's a complete different question because 20 years ago, they didn't have UX practices in play. It yeah. was just like, hey, what about if we do this process and we automate it in a computer? That was it. That's automate processes. Yeah. So like the question after you build a design system is do all of the adopters for this design system, those products, do they actually need the design system? Do they actually need that product or not? So that's a good question. Yeah, this product is too old that it might be solving a problem, but what about if we can solve the problem in a better way? and faster right. and more efficient. And it can increase the revenue to the company. And then you escalate it to a place that you need to recreate that product again. I think it's about asking the right question from what I'm listening. Like I think the a great skill that you definitely need in your in your field is to be able to ask the question that's not the most obvious, but maybe the one that's closer to what gets you to the solution in a way. Because you're telling like one question leads to the other one. It's kind of like a spiral, you know? And I've seen I've seen moments in people's like as a student especially when somebody creates a campaign whatever in advertising for example they spend 2 weeks on it in college 2 weeks spending on a campaign it's like mm -hmm. 2 years in real life and like you you think it's so long and then the yeah. professor comes and they're like that's not the campaign like that's first of all that's not a problem and your campaign does not solve anything else and they go back and they realize, like the professor says, you haven't asked the right question. Dude, it's tough for someone like a company that has a product that they had for I don't know how long. They come to you and they say, hey, I think we need like a UI fix. Can you help us? And you're like, sure. You do the UI fix and then you're like, by the way, your stuff isn't working. This, this is not working. Like your 
premise is the is like the the solution or the problem is not there. Have you ever, like it's hard to accept change, and that's what I want to get at. Like, how much part of your job is asking the right question, and how much part of your job is convincing people and brands that change is okay? Now that that's that's a really really interesting question. I think it hits a problem where you go into a legacy business where they're not used to do this kind of stuff. You tell them, hey, I need to talk to the user. No, 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 the, you, you gotta talk to the user, come on, like, no. no. And you're like, dude, I need to talk to him. Like, what are you building then? So I think you need to be an advocate for uh, UX practices to, to actually get involved into it, like to actually be able to convince the stakeholders to give you access. I think uh, that's where you're gonna see that kind of resistance from people to do it. Um, I've experienced like interesting stuff where uh, in my own, not my team, but in my own company, the product manager, they didn't want to give access to the user because they didn't think that it was the right thing to do. And then we finally got the, the access to the, um, to the users. And then we actually designed something that it wasn't like they had a design in place. And then we designed something different because we found that the user they didn't need that thing that it was in place. They needed this thing that we built. So we validated and then it was like, you see why it's important? Like, yeah. we now are building something that we know for, sh- not for sure, but we know by paper and by our research and we can validate that they are going to need it. Yeah, maybe you fail, right? Like maybe at the end of the day, the tool didn't solve the problem, but at least you're like, it, it's a high percentage of um, success rate that you're going to actually solve the problem. So I think you just need to push and, the word that I love the most is validate. So if you validate your answer, you're keen. Let's say, hey, um, I need to do user research. No, no, you can do it. Yeah, I need to do it. Why? Let me do it. You do it. And then when you validate that you were right is when you, you win them. And all the time you're going to win it. No, but yeah. you, all the time you're going to win it because you have the info. It's not like, yeah, it's not I'm right, you're wrong. It's just convince them to adopt that thought process. And they've never experienced it. Some people, they've never experienced it and they're not going to accept the change. So like you said, accepting the change is hard. So you just need to push, push, push because once you validate your answer, you are going to be, everyone is going to be happy. Client happy, user happy, and you as a designer, you're going to be happy building a product that actually is solving a problem. This is, this is so interesting. And I know that you took this skill that you have, these various types of skills that you have and passions and applied it towards your own company i know that you're the co-founder of two under which is a golf clothing brand um and i know that you've also played as a golf you you play golf on the pro tour right for a year two years yep um could you tell me a bit of well could you start with two under and how you applied that kind of thinking to your own brand and then just kind of go a bit into like you know later on we can just talk about a bit about the golf but right now since we're in the topic i really want to know how you adopted those design thinking systems and uh, or design systems and apply them to two hundred. No, that's, that's, that's a good, good topic to talk about. Um, and I think one thing led to the other. So the reason why uh, Felipe, which is my co-founder and I, we founded two hundred is because we both had the dream of playing professional golf, right? And we both did it. We both were professionals today. We both are amateurs and and then, I mean, we didn't keep going to that, towards that dream uh, for different reasons in life. But when we were doing it, we realized that it's really hard to find a, not just a sponsor, because talking about sponsors, it's a complete different, uh, a different conversation. We're talking about a place where you can be recognized with what you do, someone that cares. And we both are from Mexico. So we were like, we were just thinking like, this is tough. Like, yeah, we know that everyone is struggling. Being, being in a professional attitude is really hard. But we realized that you need to have certain skills and certain connections or certain money and status to get that help, to get that light spot. So the reason why we created Two Under is because we wanted to create a company that will help grow golf in Mexico. That, that's basically our, our yeah, mission. We want to help. Mission. Yeah, yeah, and it, and it's cool because the way that we want to do it, and of course, I mean, it's it's been a long road, but we, the way we want to do it is to in the future to have help kids that want to play golf and they are good and they have skills, but they don't have the support. They probably they don't have the money. They don't have the support. They don't know. They don't have the knowledge that what is the road to make it into a uh, the pro tour because they don't they don't know. 
And I think that happened to both of us where, I mean, today communication is different and you can find everything online and people knows and whatever, but we didn't know what was the path to make it. And, uh, and I think it's, that, that's our goal. Um, and that's how I can tell you that I use my knowledge into that because we found a problem that it was our problem and we were users as well. And we had people around us that we knew what was the problem and we we're creating a solution. I think um, we're still working on what that solution is going to be. We also always have ideas. We create things. Um, I think do that is not our main job and it's just our side thing that we do. Right. Um, it gets tricky. Definitely last year, we didn't do anything zero. Like we didn't work because I mean, he had responsibilities in his job and I had another responsibility in his job last year with COVID. So it was like, let's say last year, it was a, no, I'm not going to say wasted. It was just a lost year for us. We didn't do anything. So right. looking into what we do. Yeah. We, we do put these kind of methodologies into place to learn, Hey, we have this idea. Are we solving a problem? How do we do it? Let's make it. And of course, he has a business background and me with my background of uh, visual designer and user experience. I think we, we make a really cool team. That, that was really interesting. And I remember you talking and I might be wrong, but you were talking about one of the guys on the tour is wearing your clothes, right? I mean, or quite was. a few people No, we, we still help that. That's our purpose. Like, I mean, I'm going to say like, we are not a profitable business at all. Like we haven't been <laughs> profitable. That, it's no, nice that you're like no other to help. No, that, that's the point. Like, I mean, I think we have invested more into helping others. And you know what is the cool thing about helping others? Like that a brand comes to you and tells you, hey, I'm going to support you. Yeah, we don't have the money to pay you right now, but hey, I'm going to dress you. I'm going to give you clothes for a full week of a tournament. And that's cool. We deal with a lot of people. We also learn something. A lot of people, they don't give a shit. Like they, there's a lot of people that we know that they haven't been thankful to us. And that's that's just a learning process where we are like, they don't, see that it's something that we're doing to help them grow and they don't recognize that and some people that they want more so we found a lot of things we are learning i think um we definitely we don't have a program in place for ambassadors we do it but we don't have the full program because we've learned about it we right. learned that some people they are not thankful so we need to co we need to come up with a full program of what kind of ambassador are you why do you deserve to be helped by us and I think that's a question that now we need to make because the way that we've done it, it was kind of like, Hey, he's my friend. I know him. I think he's cool. Let's help him out. Uh, or, Hey, I think he, he's going to do great in the next season. How about we help them? Let's do it. And it's just been struggling. Um, we also, the other struggle that we've had is that we haven't made it into e-commerce. So we, we, have an e-commerce and i mean coming from me yeah. building products and interfaces it's a, a weird way to do it but i mean building your e-commerce uh, site is not just designing it and putting it up it's having a back order uh having someone that it's there um to receive an order and also creating a full season of clothing because yeah we have enough to put a few articles that are that we have in the stock but how are we going to be profitable if we're not selling that way? The way that we've been profitable, and that's where we found the niche market, it was dressing junior teams and uh, country clubs teams in Mexico. So like their junior nice. team is going to go to the mini tour in Mexico, like their junior golf team. Um, so we dress them, they buy from us. So instead of buying from a massive company, I don't know, instead of buying Under Armour clothes, Right. Dude, they're from Mexico. What about if we buy them from them? And it's cheaper. It's We don't have the same quality, but it's a good quality. They have cool designs. And how about if we do it? And that's the niche market that we found. And I think 2017, 2018, and 2019, that's what we did. And I think it was pretty cool to see a lot of kids wearing our clothes. I think that was, yeah. that's been the most rewarding thing to do, dude. Like just looking at a lot of kids wearing our clothes. The clothes that I designed with some, that's just... For me, that was really, really cool. I know this might be a bit like not on the topic, but it's, I think right now your brand is needed the most because right now all these kids that want to pursue a sport, it's tough. A lot of my friends are like, dude, it's tough, especially when you're junior and you're not like NBA leagues where you can go and play and not mm -hmm. wear a mask and everything. No, it's getting super hard to go on a tour and, and, and play. Apart from being expensive, it's getting complicated too. 
And I feel like brands like yours that go on and help people or are set out to help people, even though they're not profitable yet, um, I think they're going to make a big difference in that. And I don't think you could have done that without you first having gone through all that experience as a golfer. Now, I, w- I told you, I was also a tennis player. I've shared yep. many, like I, we share similar experiences, but at the same time, very different. Can you tell me a bit about the difficulties and the downsides of being a golf player, a full-time golf player, and how that later helped you, you know, I don't want to word, I don't want to use the word succeed, but just helped you later in life. I think it's interesting to see wh- where every person comes from. Um, I think I've always been kind of like the underdog per se. Um, I-, I wasn't a pre- like I was a good junior player, but I wasn't a top junior player. I managed myself to make it into play college golf, and my dream was to play professional golf, of course. And uh, and I just trained a lot. It was my dream. I tried to make it, and I made it possible. Uh, I decided to do it. Uh, I think I saw a lot of struggles. I can talk about my struggles, but also the ones that I saw with other peers. And how did my skill set as a designer, as a researcher, help me? It's because I noticed things like, as a as me being me, I, I tend to observe, make notes, notice patterns, see what's happening. So I think a lot of things that I notice in the golf um, industry, in the golf world, is that. Yeah, you need to be really talented, of course, but that's basic. You need to have a talent. If not, you're yeah. not going to make it, right? So, like, th- there is that kind of, like, yeah, if you're super talented, dude, you're not going to need money or effort. You, Dude, you're just really talented. You're going to make it. Now, yeah, you need to be willing to sacrifice things. You need to be willing to dream, to do, to be committed. Of course. I mean, th- I find that to be basic like, right, dude, if you anything. don't have that, you're not going to make it. Like, come on. Like, you need to be disciplined, committed. You need to have a right mindset. You need to to, to, to compromise things. So I, I see that as a, dude, you need to have it. Like, if you don't have that, you are not even qualifying to do it. Um, and after that, I see the world of sponsorship, like I said earlier, that it's a yeah. complex topic. Because in the golf career, and I think in, I mean, in tennis, it's even worse. I think it's more expensive. But Literally, you're just investing into your career without making money until you make money. So it's kind of a weird thing because y- you are you're paying to see if you get paid, which that's completely it's, it's worst a weird thing. Plan ever. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like if I, it's like if they tell you, dude, you need to pay your ad agency so you can work there, and if you make a good campaign, we pay you. How yeah. about that? <laughs> yeah, it's no, messed so, up. It's, yeah. it's, I mean, if you see it that way, it's a, it's a really, really doesn't make sense. Um, so that's the big part, right? Like finding a sponsorships. How do you find sponsorships in golf? Well, there is no right way. There is no way to do it. Like most of the persons that I know that have got a good sponsor to actually make it into at least the PJ to Latin America, where they have like the money to go, you know, where, where do they get it from, from connections or from a rich friend? Or from someone that is like, okay, I like you, let's do it. Yeah, I know stories of people that they have been getting that money from their talent because, oh my God, he plays so good that I want to put money into him. But you need to be in a certain level for that to happen. In the beginning, it's just hustle. You need to go do it, do it. But it's so hard to get noticed. Like, why will somebody put money into you? And that that's what happened to me. Like, yeah, I, I had people that were interested, but the question was, always is why am i putting money into you like what are you going to give me in return there's nothing you're getting in return yeah maybe a photo in the newspaper that or maybe if you really play well you might be in the news but what else am i getting my logo in your t-shirt like there is not a proper system to get sponsors in the golf um world which parentheses my the thesis on my master's program was about this so that's why i'm really passionate about it because uh, what i did in my master's program it was a research piece into how do golfers in a professional level achieve success so that's why i'm really passionate about the topic because uh i did a lot of research into it and like you said i experienced it what was it like if you remember like i would love to hear a bit like a few things what did you Mm -hmm. find out what does it take to be a top golf player Okay, so one of them, that's, that's where I was going. Yeah. I, I create a framework uh, where, 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 where you notice like the, the pillars that you need to make it. Of course, 
one of the things that I heard over and over from interviews, it was that there is something that happens on a really successful golfer that you cannot explain. And it happened. And I guess it happens with every athlete. There is something that happened in their lives, that turning point that now they made it. Yeah. yeah. Like I said, you need to be talented, but something happened. Um, and some will call it faith. Some will call it luck. However you want to call it. But I heard that over and over. And that was really cool to hear. Um, kind of the pillars, let me remember. You have, um, let me see. Yep. You have on the left, you need to have yourself, which includes your talent, your skills, your determination, everything that we talked about. On the left, you need to have a proper training. So you need to have a proper coach that helps you develop those skills because you need to improve. How do you improve? You take lessons. So you need to have a coach. Inside of that coaching, there is th th there were like smaller pillars, which is like your swing coach. You might have a personal fitness uh, instructor. You might have a uh, someone that helps you with your um, what you eat. What what do you call it with your nutritionist? With your nutrition, yeah. uh, etc. Like you need to have that kind of help, right? Like that's your team. On the top part, you need a sponsor. You need money to get around. Like if not, how do you live? Like we need. You said it right earlier. It's a business. Like you need to treat yourself as a business. And that part of the pillar, it was like. As a golfer, you are a business, you need to treat it, you need to sell yourself, get money, get paid, and get paid to go play tournaments. Then the next pillar was uh, brands. So they don't count as sponsors because they're not giving you money to play, they're paying you. So they are important. And then on the other side, we have turn golf tours, the tournaments. You need to have that place to go play. So you need to be recognized. You need to know them. They need to invite you. Uh, you need to be around the society of golf to be there, right? So that's an important pillar. And then, funny enough, another thing that I heard from a lot of interviews, I, I interview a lot of uh, some PGA2 players, an agent from the PGA Tour. Like, I interview really cool people. And something that I heard over and over is the word family and advocates. You need to have your family and advocates around. Like, you don't see someone that made it al alone by himself. No, there's no chance. Either they have a mentor, either they have their their parents or their brother, or they looked up to their brother because he was really good at something and then he got encouraged to do it. But there was someone with advocates and family that made it into that place. And I find that really interesting because we forget about it and we take it for granted sometimes. And I'm sure it happened to you. How did you make it into tennis? I'm sure you saw it through your family, through your friend, a mentor, something happened to yeah. that it encouraged you to do it right and and i think we forget about it and it's really really important so i, I think that that's the framework that i created i don't know if it's a complete answer but i remember that that is that was what i found that and that was the 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 research piece that i did yeah no i and i think that a lot of the elements that you mentioned from the framework are also applicable definitely to the tennis world mm -hmm. because that moment that you called which is my favorite part of your whole framework that little thing basically says in my opinion that if you have everything else and you don't have that i don't think you can make it I don't, there's a yeah. moment in every single athlete's career like you said where there is that exponential growth like stun or maybe many times it doesn't maybe happen once you know maybe there's a few turning points and i felt it I've had it, but like just like you, I tried to go at a play at a higher level, at a professional level, and my moments of aha, my moments of like st growth stunt, maybe lasted two, three weeks, and and then you know it was back to plateau again. And I feel like those athletes can go from one year to the other, skyrocket, and then maintain themselves at that that level, mm -hmm. you know. And it's crazy. Now golf, I know that as other stuff that you do in your life requires a lot of like concentration, a lot of focus um, and a lot of flow. You know, we talk about this being in flow, being a state of flow and as creative people and as athletes, imagine both of those things. We have experienced that flow in so many different ways to the point where we kind of take it for granted. Like as a, as an athlete or as a tennis player, give me a racket. I'll throw in, I'll like take three deep breaths and I'll be like, okay, we're in a match right now. Don't matter where I was before. Or throw me, okay, 25 headlines. I need them by tonight. Done. I go into the space. Do you yeah. have some sort of habit that allows you to get better into flow, both as an athlete 
and as a designer well hmm, user research designer you have so many jobs man you're so cool i think i will say just i mean if, if they ask me what do you do like i think this is a there's a lot of memes about it but there is a question what do you do and then it's like i'm a ux designer what, what do you do <laughs> i always call myself i'm a designer like I, I don't, i'm not gonna say i'm a product designer or i'm a ux designer i'm just like i'm a designer what do you design and i'm like oh i mean the software digital product yeah I'm, i build software that and i think sense. that's yeah. a, the better way to explain it um if i have something that makes me be more creative or I just like know. not really like that like you sit down like i'm like let's picture it you sit down you have something to work on or um i think it's different but you're about to like approach the the field you're you're walking into the, the sorry the field of course you're walking into the course and you're gonna hit and it's maybe not just like a friendly match but you i don't know you have some money on the the line or some shit like that you gotta yeah, yeah. focus how do you get into that? Is it something that is just instinctive and your body kind of like gets into it? Or is I've it some sort of steps that you take? I've never thought about it, honestly. I think I think breathing helps a lot, definitely. Um, and I think uh, humans, we need to learn how to breathe. We don't know how to breathe. And then I think breathing helps us a lot to focus, to concentrate, to to create, to make, to, to, to create, to make better decisions, right? I think so. Yeah. I think yeah. I will say that what you are mentioning, it comes from practice and from training. And it is a, it is a complex answer. I will say, I think it's a lifestyle, how you do it and how do you come up to concentrate? I don't think it happens always because definitely that's why you make mistakes in, let's say in the golf course, that's why you make mistakes because it's not a perfect science. What you do, I will say like my, my personal routine, I can tell you about it, what, what I do and maybe it can help other people. Like what I tried to do is that, I don't know, like how, I would say I've been trying to meditate, but I tried to do my own kind of meditation. I, I mean, I've tried right. to do um, different styles and I like them, you know, like. Yeah. Um, what do you do? Like, where do you watch? Do you watch like online guided ones or what do you do? I I, I go by my faith and I pray. My, I think praying for me is what it gets me and it makes me be here on earth. So it's kind of like I I can read a verse of the Bible and then I analyze it. I think about it during my day. What am I going to do? How do I do it? And then that's what it kicks me in. And it helps me to meditate and understand what, what's happening today. That's the way that's that cool. I do it. But, but like I said, I go by my faith. So that's what I, what I do. Um, right. It can last for two minutes. It can last for 10 minutes, depending on what I'm reading. Sometimes the Bible is really easy to read. And then you read, I'm like, ah, oh, it's cool. That's what it means. Let's go. Let's keep going. Um, I've been trying to get into the habit of drinking a glass of water in the morning. Um, nice. As soon as I wake up, I go to the kitchen and drink a full of glass of water. Um, and I think that's, that's helping. Uh, and I think it's, I mean, dude, last year, I think we all learned so many things with COVID. I mean, for yeah. sure. But like my, my routine changed a hundred percent because I don't have anywhere to go. I mean, I go from my bed to the kitchen, to the kitchen, to the bathroom, yeah. to the bathroom, to my desk. So like, it's just like, that's my routine. Right. right. But you don't have that to catch a train. You don't have to get in the bus and get into the, I don't have to do that thing. So that routine, I had to build up a new routine. And that's why I think that it's, that I created these new things where I wake up and I do those things like drinking glass of water, turning on my lights, opening my windows, making my bed. And then I, now I'm setting myself into a place that I can start being at work. Um, I also think that sometimes, of course, work feels like work. But sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it yeah. feels like, oh, fuck, I'm doing something really cool, dude. But when it feels like work is when it's like when you're tired, when you don't want to do it. But when you're enjoying what you're doing, you don't even, I don't feel that I'm doing work. Like I'm feeling that I'm just living my day and it's just cool. Yeah. Uh, definitely, I cannot compare what I did today with what I, with working in a golf course and practicing on my swing. I, I'm yeah. never going to compare that because <laughs> that is a fucking dream. Doing that, that was really, really nice. Um, it was, I don't know. It it was a dream. Like literally I, I yeah. lived the dream for a little bit. It was, it's just really nice to be doing something that you absolutely love. And it never feels like you're doing a, a job. It feels like you right. are just enjoying what you do. That is crazy. And that's what I was going to go over. It's as, as athletes, I think that we felt that, you know, you feel that moment where you're in the, on the course and you're in the moment and the time passes. You don't know if one hour, two hours passed. You don't know how long you've been playing for unless somebody's like telling you. Yeah. And in design, you 
what do you do? You take a problem and you come up with a solution to it. And you might say that, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, we might say, oh, I love doing that because I, you know, help uh, solve solutions or because I come up with better mm -hmm. questions. But I think at the end of the day, all that we're trying to do is get to that feeling that we once had where we were just lost because we're so good at something because you have to have a certain skill to be able to just get lost like that. And you're like, get lost, get into flow and have that feeling, you know? I feel like it's a, it's an addiction that nobody talks about. It's an addiction to a good kind of sense. productive feeling, you know? And probably we're trying to replicate the feeling. I think that, that's what I had in mind when you were talking. I was like, yeah. you're trying to replicate that feeling, but probably you're doing it in your subconscious, replicating the feeling. But I have noticed myself designing something and I really, like, I, I found myself at, I don't know, at late at night, I'm just doing something really cool. I'm like, should I go to eat or should I stay here? Like, I'm, I'm really yeah. having fun. <laughs> I mean, yeah. like I say, it doesn't happen always, of course. Um, but it's the same feeling that I had being in the putting green with mosquitoes. There is no light and my cell phone there with my friend just putting because uh, – because we wanted to do it and we it was 8 p.m but we were still yeah. putting it was like we arrived at the golf course at 7 30 in the morning but we were still there because and it's not because they were paying us it's yeah. not because it's because we we wanted to be better and we loved it so much that we were doing it um and i think it's really hard to compare it to to doing a job it is really hard to compare it but i can say that i felt it sometimes when it's so so good what you're doing that you forget about it and you are enjoying it. And I think that that is that is a really, really, really nice feeling to have. Listen, man, as we're approaching the, the final part, I, got, I have to say that everything that you kind of like talked about today is great advice, not only for me, because I'm like a few steps be behind you, let's say, in the in the process of of life, you know, the process of experience. You've gone through a lot. And as a researcher, you know about a lot. Um if you had a piece of advice for the young creatives that are at my age, you know, 21 to 23, 24, 25, and even people above that, everyone's struggling to get a job right now. How mm -hmm. would you talk to those people and what would you tell them? What kind of advice would you have? Because I know that you were in a similar situation last year. Yeah. What would you tell them? No, no, no. And I think you said something. I think we are learning. Like the, what you said, I still feel the same way. I'm still learning. And I can look at people and be like, oh, dude, you already lived a lot. So yeah. Uh, I guess I, I don't know how to answer to that. I guess like it's cool that you see me that way because <laughs> we are all in the same boat. Um, I will say first than anything, don't be afraid of applying for a job. Don't be afraid about doing it. Like because I think something that I've experienced myself and I've seen people do that they are afraid about sending that email. They're afraid about showing their work. They're afraid about. Uh, I mean, I'm not gonna say if you're nervous, that's fine. Because if you're not nervous, is that it means that you're not enjoying anything you're doing. But don't be afraid about sending the email. Don't be afraid about applying to that company. Um, don't be afraid about showing your work right now. I think that's what, what I will say. Don't be afraid of doing it. Um, definitely, there are a lot of technicalities that you can do to find a job. Um, there are two things. If you need a job, you're going to do whatever it needs to take to make money because that's the reality. But if you're looking for a career, be patient. And it's going to come to you. Like last year, honestly, when, because I mean, you know, I was laid off for COVID because of COVID-19 and I was put in a spot that I, I, I had just like, I had two months to get a job before I lost my sponsor visa. Right. So in my mind was like, I'm just going to get a job. Yes. I applied to a career opportunity, but I applied to a lot of places that were just jobs. And I think that's completely different, right? So if you're just looking for a job, you can go work anywhere. Like you're going to yeah. find a job. I think what is hard is to find a career because that's where you don't feel that you're performing a job. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the big advices. Recognize if you are looking for a job or you're looking for a career. What, what is your ambition? Are you looking for a career? Yeah, you're not going to care. I mean, it's important how much they pay because they are not going to go somewhere that doesn't pay you well. But that's not going to be relevant. It's going to be more relevant. What is your career path? What do you want to do instead of a job? Yeah, a job can pay you more but maybe you're not even happy doing this. So I think that's the second piece of thoughts that I have. I won't say that I'm going to give advice to anyone, but the thoughts that I have is just recognize if it's a job or a career. Um, and I think go back to the don't be afraid. Once you get contacted by the recruiter or by someone in the company, they'll be really straightforward. I think 
uh, what people in a company they like the most is that you're straightforward about what you feel and how you're doing and don't, don't fake it. If you don't know something, tell them, no, I've, I've never had experience with that. Um, yeah. I think honesty is the, 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 the key to, to be successful because it's going to help you. What about if you tell them like, yeah, I kind of work with that software, but I don't remember. And then they hire you and you really don't know how to use it. And then you put, in, you, you put yourself in a spot where it's really awkward. So I think you just need to be honest about everything that you are telling them and you're going to find your right match. Now, like I said, recognize if it's a job or a career. Yeah. And I've seen a lot of people just do like temporary jobs while they're looking for their perfect career. And that's a, and that's a tricky place because sometimes you get stuck, but sometimes it's the correct thing to do. Like, hey, what do you prioritize? Like when you say authentic is be authentic to the to the employer, but be authentic to yourself as well. The only reason I'm saying this is because I feel like it's a repeating pattern when I'm asking this question is most of the people tend to used to go like uh, just work hard, make sure that you apply to everything. And it, the mentality has changed from, you know, putting the work hard because everyone knows you got to do the work, you know, do the hard work. It's changed to look at what you want. Look at what you mm -hmm. really want. Do you want a job or do you want a career? Do you want to go to a place that you're going to despise for three months, but you know that you're going to save enough? So you can start whatever you want to start or do you, are you patient? Like, I feel like that's super important and I hope no, that, no, that more people sense. switch the thinking towards that as well. No, but, but what you said, it's important also to, to say, if you have to get a job while you find your career, that's completely fine. It's just, yeah. my thought was recognize what is a job and what is a career, because if not, you're going to get frustrated. Recognize yeah. that that's temporary. It's getting you through. You're you're making money because yeah, we live in a world that it that it, that it that it's about papers. You need to make money to pay. So if you are in a job, that's fine. I mean, do it. Right. Be responsible. Blah blah blah. But keep focusing on your career. Like, don't forget about that. Because yeah. I think the problem, like you said, is that they forget about it. They get trapped into the job. People get depressed. They don't like what they're doing. And at the end of the day, it's bad for the employee for the because you're not performing your job right and then it, it's 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 unhappy moments for everyone so i think it's just recognizing if you're in a job or you're in a career that's crazy hey man i have one question that brought up in my mind do you have time if mm -hmm. i ask you yeah sure no no you're good so this has led me to believe that you know there's a lot of creative people or artists that study their field you know we've we've, we've grown with them and then they they cannot get a job within their field and they do recur to getting a job that either doesn't do anything with their field or it's not the ideal job and many of the times what they realize is oh i'm just gonna do this job that gets me paid because i actually don't want to get paid for what i've been doing there's so many artists that go through the four-year college to become whatever they want to become like illustrators uh, writers whatever even advertisers and then they realize that Oh, wait, I just like doing that, but I don't want to do it for a living. Do you know, like, I, my, I guess my, what my question is, is like, do you see a difference between the people who do that and then the people who are like us, maybe, who like we studied like advertising and you studied what you studied and then you were like, oh, I'm, for example, I was willing to take a job and I took a job that wasn't exactly on my career path path as you would say but it was something that was necessary because you know covid and i had to make money but i was like always 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 thinking okay i gotta get out because i actually want to do this many people are not like that many people are like oh wait so i can get a steady income and i can just paint on my side or write on the side great that's it so many people decide that art is not something that they want to pursue professionally have you ever felt like that have you ever felt that you wish you could do what you did and not get paid for it and just like do it for fun no, I haven't actually. I think, I mean, I would, I would say golf, that right? I felt. No, because I will like, th this is the way that I see it. Golf for me was a way that I wanted to get paid for it. Like that's okay. the way that I saw it. Today for me, golf, it's my passion. It's a hobby that I do. And I think if someone, I think, yeah, you're right. Golf was that. For me, golf, I trained my entire life to do it. I got, let's say, I mean, I got a job doing it and I realized that it wasn't going to be my career path for many reasons. 
So now it's my hobby. So I guess people yeah. that, let's say, go to school to do arts and then they get the job, they don't like it, they go to other thing and they kept painting on the side, it's because they didn't, they, they do it right. as a hobby. So it is, it is their hobby. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, it's I like you can call it that way. we're parallel in between like what like what happened with you and, and golf and me and tennis and other people and their their passions. You know, we you realize that you're what you're really passionate about it might be something that you don't necessarily want to make money from. You know, no, That's, yeah, it's, or I mean, maybe like, you cannot, and you're like happy to continue playing. You know, or maybe, or maybe. I mean, I don't know if I will say because I think that's too bold for me to say that I don't want to make money out of golf. Like, of course, if I if I if I had the chance and I have the talent today, I would love to do it. So yeah, so I will say I recognize that I cannot make money out of that. So I now took a different career path, and I still love that so much that I do it on the side as a hobby. And nice. I think I see it that way. But if you give me the opportunity tomorrow, like let's say tomorrow I wake up and I have the talent of Justin Thomas. I'm gonna go do it and quit yeah. my job and do that. I'll do it a hundred, a hundred out of a hundred. So yeah. I think probably that's what a hobby is. I, I don't know. I don't know what is the definition of a hobby, but maybe that's yeah. what a hobby is. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. It's if, weird. Yeah, cause, yeah, because I guess a hobby is like if they pay you to do that, will you do it twenty four seven? I think most people will tell you that they will do that as, as their hobby if they pay you to do that. Yeah, as their hobby. But you wouldn't like, it's a difference between saying, okay, I'm, well, you'd say yeah, you would go play professional, like you would go do the whole uh, thing, I'll you know? It. Yeah, it, yeah. That's, what, that's what I was asking. I was like, yeah, I think that that's what it is. I think that you're like, golf is the side thing, is the one thing they really wanted to do. Why did I bring this up? Because you said, do you want a job or do you want a career? And yeah. do you, what do you want? What, do you, what is it going to be? Are you going to have, have a job for a while? And I think that you realize, like, okay, okay, golf isn't, I want to do golf. Like, you know, I want to have a job at Droga 5 or I want to have a, a job at whatever agency, you know? Not me, but like, I'm just saying somebody. Yeah. But I can't. So you put it on the side and you, basically you, the advice that you gave everyone, you already done. I, I just wanted to point that out that basically you put golf on the side and you continue with it and you still play, right? Like you, well, whenever you mm -hmm. can, how is it now? It's, you can still play, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, right now in Chicago, you cannot fucking play. It's too cold. Yeah, but, you're not... Uh... Oh, wait, you're not allowed to play? No, dude, it's too cold. How am I going to play oh. in fucking five degrees Celsius? Dude, no, I know. Chance, negative 10. <laughs> okay, so I didn't know that golfers were like that. Okay, because I used, I played in temperatures. I, well, I didn't play in freezing temperatures. I'm not going to be like, but I've No, uh, no, you, no. You, you can I've play played. in cold weather. Yeah. No, no, no. You yeah. can play golf in cold weather. But right now, there is no chance today to snow. Like, you're not going to play like right. that, dude. Yeah, no. no, you're fine. You're right. Um, yeah. So, like, during the summer, I will play once a week at least, and then go to the practice range at least once as well. As well, so during the summer yeah. here in Chicago, I go during the weekend once, and then during the week after work, I go to the practice range. So yeah, I keep, I, I try to keep my game on in a good place. Yeah, so that's a, it's, it's a good uh, thing, you know. You can keep no, that, that, stuff that, you like. That was a good conversation, actually. I've never thought about it. You, you yeah. just helped me to realize something that I didn't realize. Like I was thinking about another type of like getting a job within outside of golf but i guess it, it makes sense it's relatable i i i can relate yeah. to that too yeah, it's because no, you had two great. jobs you had we we had a job as an athlete that's why it's so weird for us to get a hobby today yeah but i'm gonna say something maybe one of because you need to know that my my thesis for the masters i did it years later after i was a professional golfer so yeah. if i knew that information back then probably i will be telling a different story but something that i didn't do while i was there it was, I tried it, but I never believed it and I didn't do it. I didn't, I didn't treat myself as a business. I didn't treat myself as an employee. I didn't treat myself as say, this is a job, Max. I think I tried it, but I was never successful at it. I never did it. And I, I'm telling you, that's one of the reasons why I didn't make it. Because yeah. myself, I didn't treat myself as this is a business. Let's do it. Yeah, I tried. I, I tried to do a business plan. I tried to do budget and expenses, but fully, ex uh, at the full extent, no, I didn't do it. I, I didn't make it. It was, yeah. it, it is a complex thing to do, to treat it as a job when you like it so much as a hobby and treat it as a job. I think that was, that was hard. Yeah. That's the thing. I'm so much happier to play tennis today sometimes than I was to play back then. Cause there's no responsibility. There's nothing. I just go and play and hit a ball, you know? So yeah. I, I, no, I, no, it's, it's, it was a nice conversation about that. You know, it's uh, still about the same kind of subject, you know? No, hey, no, for sure. 
dude, listen, I enjoyed so much talking to you and you shared so much with me and with uh, you know the whole audience. I just wanted to thank you so much for taking the time uh, sure. out of your day. And I'm hopefully I can have you on some other time because I see a thousand other conversations that I can have you with and yeah, man. things we can explore together. You know, I had breakthroughs just talking to you about a lot of things. So that's cool. Thank you. Well, I'm glad yeah. it was a very great conversation. I think we talked about a lot of things. Um, and good luck with this uh, with this podcast. I think it is exciting to to get into this um, creativity podcast uh, section in the podcast yeah. world. <laughs> so it's pretty cool. So good luck with that. Thank you so much. It's pretty cool that that people like you also accept to come in and, and just share their no, for sure. Uh, I loved life, it, man. You know, knowledge. <laughs> ah, this right, is man. cool. Uh, I loved it. All right, thank you. Perfect. Take care of yourself, uh, and we'll you. see you. Bye bye. All right, talk to you later. Bye, man. Uh,